them are always macrolide like antibiotics. You can choose also the phenocycline family, which are doxycycline, uh, most commonly used, um, and even clindamycin. That's how we choose. Okay. The diffuse alkalized infection. How do you acquire this? Is the first infection that you need to know. Okay. <laughs> From this presentation to the beginning, from this slide to the beginning, nothing to know. What? Just what? Wait, wait, wait. So you came late? I said it. I said that I'm just gonna be talking generally, just for your information, and then after that, we're gonna go one by one. Of course, the treatments are need to know, I mean, you need to know, and, and I'm going to be talking about all the treatments in every single slide, okay? Start recording now. Start recording now. <laughs> so, Clostridium difficile. What is that? This is no more than what? An intestinal infection, right? That is a gram negative uh, adderall bacteria that a patient has a normal colon co comes into you without any type or symptoms of gastroenteritis. And the most common relevant history is the exposure to antibiotics. Of course, if I have C. diff and you share my room, or if I have C. diff and there's no proper hand hygiene of either the caretaker, family members, patient itself, or the healthcare providers, of course the infection will be spreading to others, right? But assume that this patient comes to you to your office or to your ER, okay? And they haven't been exposed to it, doesn't live in a nursing home or anywhere, hasn't been exposed to anybody with the same condition. The first question you have to ask the patient, have you been on antibiotic for any other reason recently? That's one of the major histories for this patient. So of course, having antibiotic, what does it do to the intestinal flora? Oh, it kills it, right? So basically that intestine becomes an aseptic uh, um, colon, right? And of course, opportunistic infections attack, and one of those is significant clostridium difficile, which is a gram-negative bacteria that can normally live in the intestinal flora, but becomes pathogenic when there is a major insult, okay? So what happens is that the gut becomes uh, full of uh, uh, um, uh, the microflora of the Clostridium difficile and produces, as you can see, like a membrane full of bacteria, right? And what happens is that the spores continues to penetrate in the colon and produces a major inflammatory process that water is attracted to the colon and the patients start having water and diarrhea, of course with the smell of the enterotoxin, which is the Clostridium difficile. Okay, how do you best treat Clostridium difficile? And that's again, well, how do you best diagnose? Um, Stool um, culture. culture. Stool culture, right? And how do you best treat? Um, now, the best way to treat Cedric Psycholitis is to reach the colon, right? And the only way you reach the colon is by having oral <laughs> antibiotics. There's three different phases of Clostridium difficile, right? Mild, to moderate, it's one, okay? <clears throat> Severe and fulminant, okay? The major difference is that, listen to me, clinically, the patient has diarrhea, both of them, three of them have diarrhea. The three different classifications have the same symptoms. Now, the first mild to moderate, the patients, of course, WBC is less than 15,000. Remember that normally is up to 10, right? Mm -hmm. And the patients, since they have diarrhea, they're at risk for acute kidney injury, right? Pre-renal renal failure, right? Mm -hmm. So the creatinine is less than 1.5. That's the criteria. Having the same signs and symptoms of CD cyclitis, but the WBCs are less than 15,000 and the creatinines are less than 1.5. So those patients, if you treat our patient, of course, you have to tell the family the proper hygiene, not to transmit to the other family members. 
but it can be treated in our patient with oral antibiotics. And it's vancomycin oral, flagyl oral, okay? You can also add rifaximine, but you could also add oral, not in combination, dipistate. Okay, that's, that's another type of antibiotic. Which so is a micro life pump. Dipistate once you completed a vancomycin treatment and it failed? Like for us, normally they do that. So, then that's mild to moderate. Severe is basically the patient that has the opposite, right? Same signs and symptoms with WBC more than 15,000 and the creatinine is more than 1.5. So that means that the amount of stools that these patients have had have compromised their renal function, right? And that patient cannot stay outpatient. It has to be brought in patient because you have to treat the acute kidney injury, right? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the patients might go into chronic renal failure. So that patient, not only you're gonna give the vanco, PO, and preferable as well, flagyl PO, but again, these patients are so dehydrated that most likely you will give also uh, vanco PO and flagyl IV, okay? But again, my guideline is not necessary to start IV, only hydration. So far, so good. Mm -hmm. Now, what do you think will be formula? Uh, not only hypotension and up to the point of shock that are not um, improving with IV fluids, but what else can be added to it? The presence of illness? Renal failure. Of course, the patient is going to be in the same. Renal failure of more than 15,000, mm -hmm. but also risk of megacolon. Megacolon. The presence of megacolon is fulminant. And those patients have to be seen not only IV fluids, but IV, Vanco, IV, Flagyl. Which the majority of the, of the patients hospitalized, even if they have severe uh, CDP colitis, they're treated as fulminant just to prevent, okay? This major complications of perforation. Now, you have been already on deficit and you fail you have been on Vanco PO, Flagyl PO, and you failed, you have to be brought to the hospital and uh, uh, treated IV first as a challenge. And last resource, fecal transplant. Okay. Yes, fecal transplant. It's not that I'm taking the pieces from you and put it in the another patient's colon, but it's actually processed in the lab. aware of it, dispense, 
but that doesn't happen in outpatient centers. So you can also work outpatient in many types of specialties, so, or even internal medicine as an acute care nurse practitioner. And uh, there's a lot of mistakes that not asking the patient proper allergies, and you dispense, um, you, know, you prescribe, and even could be, can fall into the um, error of the pharmacist as well, and dispense the medications. Okay, so check allergies. So, what are you going to find most likely in these patients that have any type of infection? Remember, excluding elderly populations that can come with a normal WBC or even a leukopenia. Leukopenia is a, sign of, is a sign of infection as well. The same as fever is not present in the majority of the elderly populations, and instead they come with altermental status or hypothermia. Hypothermia is also a sign of infectious process. So look at the WBC, remember that depending on the hospital that you work or laboratory parameters, 10 to 11, no more than that. Uh, if it's higher than that, then you will look at a process of infection. It doesn't have to be necessarily bacterial infection. Remember bacterial, you have to look at the differential, which is not present here. And uh, look, yes, it's here. Look at the neutrophils, mostly bands, right? Versus lymphocytes in viral infection. Now what else can infectious process bacterials can produce? Remember that whenever there's an infectious process or either, either inflammation, platelets migrate to the area. So patients can have thrombocytopenias due to uh, severe sepsis. Okay? So bacterial spread, again, think about immunocompromised patients. Only to the point of diabetes up to the point of HIVs and cancers. Patients are in chemotherapy, radiation. Patients that for some disease process as well, they are immunosuppressors or anti-metabolites, okay? Look at the list of the medication because that can lead you to think that this is an immunocompromised post, okay? So those are the possibilities that we have. Uh, patients that have, for example, I don't know, uh, strep shouldn't go to the point of having endocarditis or meningitis. Or a patient, again, as I said, having just a motor vehicle accident and having a fracture normally doesn't go up to the point of osteomyelitis or discitis or septic arthritis. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we should heal. So let's start with the cases. 37-year-old uh, admitted to the inpatient step-down floor with history of fever, chills, muscle soreness, which myalgia is part of uh, any infectious process, shortness of breath, and weight loss. So this is a 37-year-old male that has weight loss. But really depending on the uh, amount of days that have passed, remember that severe sepsis can produce cachexia. Mm -hmm. It's a highly catabolic state, but of course it doesn't happen in a week, right? Uh, depending on the amount of weight that the patient has lost in a small amount of time, for example, we receive a patient, uh, I, I received a patient on Friday, 45 years of age, male, that have lost 30 pounds in one month. Yeah. Is that normal? No. no. Exactly, and actually the patient had lung cancer with metastasis already with the lumbar spine. He never came with shortness of breath or anything. The major complaint of, of, of patient coming was lumbar pain, severe lumbar pain, okay? That it wasn't really with anything. And of course, because the patient was uninsured, the patient didn't have the proper analgesia, right? And that um, made, him, made him come to the hospital. Okay, so tell me based on that, tell me proper differential diagnosis. So, so far here I have fever and chills and myalgia, okay, and shortness of breath. Mm -hmm. So, what made you think first, even though we're gonna go through systems, is re respiratory tract infections, right? Mm -hmm. And having a weight loss, depending on the amount of time that we have this weight loss, is either because the patient has been having anorexia, and that's the reason why the patient becomes cachectic and the catabolic 
phase also accelerated that, or the patient has cancer. Unfortunately, nowadays, I have seen so many diseases in the ICU in young patients that age is not a relevant factor anymore for disease one. Okay, I have seen strokes of 20 years of age. Of course, this patient of 20 years of age was in multi drugs. All right, so differential diagnosis. If we go through a systems, what will make you rule out the possibility of meningitis if a patient has fever and chills and myalgia? Fever. Patient doesn't have photophobia. Patient doesn't have photophobia, right? Patient doesn't have particular rash that might indicate a serum meningitis. Patients on the examination wouldn't have local rigidity, right? Or the patient doesn't have uh, uh, any type of focal neurological deficit or outer mental status that might make you think about that, okay? Uh, endocarditis, um, patient, for example, in this particular case, uh, even though we haven't gone through the physical examination, the patient, you can ask kind of what about dental uh, hygiene or um, look yourself to see if you see any type of uh, major abscess in the mouth or any uh, recent extraction of a molar or look at the entire uh, dental hygiene for the patient. Uh, any type of upper respiratory drug infection that might make you indicate that the patient or this microorganism penetrated uh, in the in the heart, or the patient doesn't have any type of congenital uh, heart anomaly, right? That can indicate that the patients can have endocarditis. In addition to that, what else will rule out endocarditis? Um, right. If you do an examination, you don't hear any murmurs on the patient, right? <coughs> Which is one of the major criteria. If you see that uh, you do an echocardiogram and there's no uh, type of uh, uh, oscillation of a mass or uh, vegetation, there's no valvulopathies, those are indicative. In minor criteria, if you look at the, for example, fever, if it's not greater than 39, which is a minor, remember the splinter hemorrhages, right, and the nodules, um, even though we're gonna go now one by one. Uh, pericarditis, what make you rule out pericarditis on this patient? Again, the patient never complained of chest pain, even though it was complaining of shortness of breath, right? So that's one indicator that pericarditis normally is not present in this patient. If you do an electrocardiogram, the widespread ST elevation, um, right, is not present. You can do ESR, you can do CRP, might be elevated just because this is an infectious process anyhow, right? But, um, what else would you do in pericarditis? An echocardiogram, and you don't see any pericardial effusion. Uh, uh, so those are fa factors that we take into account. Heart failure, in a 37-year-old patient, patients can have heart failure, right? Yeah. But heart failure will give you shortness of breath and mo mostly orthopnea and paracetamol dyspnea, but it wouldn't give you fever, chills, mm -hmm. etc. okay? And like that, we can go one by one and start ruling out all the disease processes, right? And uh, even though we're gonna go through each uh, disease in a second, okay? So you have all the possible uh, diagnosis that these patients can have, but I'm more inclined to think that this patient has any type of lower respiratory tract infection, okay? And if this is the case, what are we going to do? Well, let me prove it with a chest X-ray, right? Even though I have the clinical signs and symptoms, I'm not gonna wait for that because I have the uh, uh, clinical manifestations, right? And if I have a CBC and I have leukocytosis and I have neutrophilia and I have bandemia and I also take the patient and I hear bronchi and I see the sputum myself, that's more than enough, right? Mm -hmm. Even though we can do a chest x-ray fast and just look now through the machine, right? That's the beauty of this country. And you can diagnose pneumonia. Uh, what else are you going to do? Fusal culture, right? Uh, and start empiric antibiotic treatment. In this case, he's a 35, he's a 35, so what will you do? Acetromycin, right? And based on the physical examination and signs and symptoms, most likely the curve criteria for this patient is really low, so that patient can be discharged and be treated on patient, right? Mm -hmm.
Another case is a uh, 67 female uh, fell well until appropriately one week ago when she developed an open respiratory tract infection. She improved slowly, but during the past 48 hours has developed a more serious cough with significant production of rust color, excuse me, remember, yellow, green, or rusty bacteria, okay? Uh, fever, chills, muscle aches, brought to the hospital after waking up in the AM, mildly confused. That's part of the curve, right? And uh, 67, more than 65, but you already have two there, right? Um, complaining of severe headache, she reports of a bad cold a week ago, and now she feels like her neck is really stiff and uh, extremely painful when she tilts her neck uh, forward. Uh, bright lights hurt, so that's photophobia. Mm -hmm. There's no skin rash or nausea and vomiting. So even though we started with the signs and symptoms of pneumonia, this pneumonia apparently in this 67 year old male was severe enough, most likely immunocompromised. We don't know that fact yet until we investigate. Many patients don't know, are not properly diagnosed or never go to healthcare providers and they don't know, right? And they manifest this way. Um, so patients have now what? Complications with? Exactly. Most commonly associated with streptococci pneumonia type of meningitis and non hysteria or meningococci. Why? Because it, it came in, it started with a, a lower respiratory tract infection. Okay? Even though the treatment is different. Um, so the physical exam, she is in acute distress with headache and intermittent chills and coughing. She appears her age, temperature 101.5, heart rate is 115, respiratory rate is 24. If you recall, the curve was more than 30, mm -hmm. so it's still at two, okay? Blood pressure 160 over 70, which is not part of the criteria because the BP has to be low. Uh, and you have the weight and whatever. Uh, anyways, even though she's a two, I'm not gonna admit this patient to the outpatient uh, regular units because already has signs and symptoms of meningitis. You, you understand? That's a major complication. So it has to be in the ICU. So this patient is submitted like BCS of 14. All the cranial nerves are intact, but you have positive Kernick and Brzezinski. Mm -hmm. Okay? Remember that Kernick says that when you uh, bend the, the head, the knee flexes, right? And backwards, when you flex the knee, the head flexes, right? And Brzezinski is the, as well, yes. So I'll show you that in a second. So patient has photophobia, neck stiff, uh, stiffness, cervical lymphadenopathy, uh, using accessory muscles, um, with decreased right middle lobe and right lower lobe with crackles and uh, the rest of the lungs are clear. Look at the uh, laboratory results. You have a normal hemoglobin, but the WBC is 14,000, right? Clears are normal, these are normal. Normal. CSF. Let's talk about that. When you receive a patient with meningitis, will you do a CSF analysis right away? Okay. okay, that's what we do in clinical practice, right? You have to do a CT scan of the brain first mm -hmm. to rule out the possibility that the patients not only have a midline shift or a cerebral edema or compromise of the ventricles that can indicate that the patient has an increased intracranial pressure, right? Because otherwise when you do a lumbar puncture, you get craniated patient. Now, I'll show you again, even though I had it, we had it in 67, the criteria, when do you have to do a CT first? Mm. You might say, no, we do it in everybody. Yes, we do it in everybody in clinical practice, but we don't do it in everybody based on guideline unless you have an immunocompromised patient or you have a patient that has focal neurological deficit that might indicate increasing intracranial pressure, and that's when you have to do CT first before 
massaging that spine, okay? But yes, okay, so basically you believe that the patient has meningitis, will you delay treatment no. just because of the CAT scan and the lumbar puncture? No. no. So what do you have to do first? Cultures, antibiotic. Which one? Septic and blanco, right? And again, you will see that if you believe this patient is immunocompromised, then you might add a moxie, right? Moxicillin to it. Because you don't know exactly, even though, they, as, as we have the patient right now in the hospital, even though the lumbar puncture analysis points completely toward bacterial infection, I can cover, or I will cover in clinical practice, which is not necessary by guideline, with a sickle here. I'll, I'll open up the patient when you go away. Uh, so if we look here, you have the CSF appearance cloudy, which is normally serious, clear, okay? The upper pressure is 300, really high. We're gonna go through the normal values in a second. You have an elevated WBC, but what you really have to look at, elevated protein can happen in viral infections, elevated protein can happen in autoimmune conditions, elevated proteins can happen in bacteria, can happen in any condition. Just by an alteration of the meninges or the encephalon, by a meningitis or encephalitis, you can have elevated protein. So that's not a specific factor. Look at the glucose. And it's really low, really low. And the lower the number, the greater the possibility of bacteria and the more septic the patient will be, okay? But in addition to that, when you culture, okay, you have diplococci that grew strep pneumonia. We thought about that from the beginning because the patient had lower respiratory infection and we know that strep pneumonia is the most common pathogen for um, uh, pneumonia as well. And we talked about the chest x-ray, et cetera. So let's treat this patient and then we can go away. So you know about the classic triad of the meningitis, mm -hmm. right? So you have fever, the nuchal rigidities, and the outer mental spasm. Mm -hmm. So this patient also has one of the major classifications of it, phonophobia, phonophobia wasn't mentioned, but it can be part of it. Uh, the patient was uh, confused, uh, had stiff neck. So even though we most commonly in adulthood have strep pneumonia, hemophilus influenza, and a serum meningitis as the three most common agents, okay, it can be present also in patients that are immunosuppressed and alcoholics, okay? So, but I want you to look that listeria, which you have to treat with amoxicillin, okay, is not present in us. So whenever you believe that the patient has the possibility of being immunosuppressed, or the patient is an alcoholic patient, okay, you have to cover listeria, which is only covered with amoxicillin. That's the reason why you see patients with meningitis with rosetti, vanco, amoxicillin, and acyclovir. No, you add either Genta or chlorophenicols. Or you can add rifampin. Anyways, rifampin will cover all this and also helps to penetrate the blood brain brain. Is it allergic to amoxicillin and Genta? Well, if you're allergic to amoxicillin, you can't give rosetin anyhow, right? right? No. So you're gonna give Vanco with rifampin, or you're gonna give Vanco with Genta, which are really bad, right? For your ears and your <laughs> kidneys. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Or Vanco, and you can choose also your penance, carbapenance, independent, and meropenance, which they have a very mild cross sensitivity reaction with penicillin. So you can choose the carbapenance. And you have seen carbapenance with Vanco, uh, chloramphenicol with Vanco, Genta with Vanco, which is a killer yeah. for your ears and your kidneys, right? Or refamping and Vanco. Or also for the atypicals of hysteria, you can also choose Doxy and Banco. Yes. So with the meningitis, I know that there's two ways to kind of go about it based on age factor 
Yeah, but I didn't touch about pediatric because you're not a pediatric. But if you look at the pediatric, they have grand negative, E. coli, and listeria. Why? Because pediatric patients and elderly patients are already in the zone of immunosuppression. So that's the reason why you have to, elderly patients, you also have to put amoxicillin on it. So seven bank for amoxicillin. We put a sickle here because we have to cover viral right. meningitis, okay? We don't know, we, have, we don't have any results yet. So you have to cover everything, okay? And uh, we have rarely already Neisseria meningitis and strep pneumonia and hemophilus influenza in pediatric population and even in elderly patients because they have the HIV vaccine, they have the meningococci vaccine, and uh, they get the pneumonia vaccine, pediatric and elderly. So we should be covered if the elderly are compliant or if the mothers believe in vaccination. Yeah, in this country, yes, in this country, okay? So we worry the most about strep pneumonias because you know that adults are not compliant uh, and also, it's, it's part of the uh, normal um, microflora that attacks the lower respiratory tract infection. The majority of the meningitis patients start with upper or lower respiratory tract infection. Okay? So, again, what are the risk factors? The most common risk factors, as I said, patients usually start with the respiratory infection, either upper or lower. Okay, if the patient has a recent neurosurgery, that's a direct yeah. port of entrance, okay? And if the patient has a recent neurosurgery, what are you gonna cover the patient with? The patient's already hospitalized having a neurosurgery, right? Mm -hmm. You have to put Vanco anyways. You start Rosepin, Vanco, Amoxicillin. Mm -hmm. Same thing. Mm -hmm. You wanna go a step higher, go Marin, which are carbapenic which are either, either, there's the same thing, Marin, imipenin, carbapenin, or with Vanco. Same thing, okay? Uh, remember that ETOH abuse and patients that are immunocompromised, listeria mono monocytogenous, so you have to cover them with amoxicillin because otherwise they won't be, okay? That'll be the only time we add them. Yes. But well, what about splenectomy? If the patient has a splenectomy, either due to a prior motor vehicle accident or the patient had a, a sequestration of, of the spleen because of sickle cells or whatever disease process, lymphoproliferative, like leukemia, lymphomas, etc. that patient is immunocompromised. Remember that I said that the spleen is in charge not only to get rid of the old cells, granated cells, but also is in charge of getting rid of the encapsulated microorganisms. And one of those are serious. So you have to cover these patients as, at least serious as well, as an immunocompromised patient. Mm -hmm. And those patients you would also add amoxicillin. HIV patients, amoxicillin. Cancer patients, amoxicillin. Lupus, scleroderma, rheumatoid arthritis, patients that for whatever reason they're immunosuppressors, amoxicillin you have to add. So then to those same ones, would you also do the acyclovir? We only do the acyclovir because we don't have an evidence that there's no viral no compromise. Right. But in reality, if we have cultures growing bacteria, then we don't there's, need no okay. there's no need. So while you wait for those cultures to get back, then you put them on the acyclovir. You have to. You have to cover them for everything. Mm -hmm. Okay? So we have all the signs and symptoms of meningitis that we already went through, mm -hmm. right? And you know them by all of them. And who's your position? But look for focal neurological deficits, which if you have a CAT scan, what is the neurological damage that you might find? That patient already has evidence of hydrocephalus. The patient has cerebral edema shifting and compromising the third ventricle, right? If the patient in the examination, if you see that the cranial nerves, any of the cranial nerves are compromised, Remember that you went through health assessment and you memorized the exam, but I do it in practice. When I do neuro ICU, I have to actually tell the patient to stick the tongue out, if they're, of course, not intubated. <laughs> Move it side to side, right? To follow my finger, you have to do everything. 
You have to close their eyes and touch their face. You have to go through every single cranial nerve to see if you're finding any type of focal deficit. Fondoscopic examination, which we rarely do, but we should do, right? If you have papilledema, that's a focal neurological deficit, and that's when you must do a CT before, okay? And of course, getting immunocompromised patients. You have here, but you do remember that the Brusinski, basically you flex the head, and the patient have a, a, a flexion of, of the, of the uh, knees, okay? And uh, another one is basically that you uh, extend the hamstring and the patients have rigidity, okay? Now, this is the algorithm guideline for meningitis. So as you can see, I need you to memorize the top, okay, for your exams and the board examination as well, because I know that we do CTs on everybody. But if the patient is immunocompromised, if the patient has any history of meningitis, encephalitis, or the patients that we have in the hospital right now, they had a history of five years ago, removal of pituitary adenoma. That's a CNS disease. So in that particular patient, you must do CT prior, right? If the patient comes to you already on seizures, you have to know what's going on on that brain before you stick a needle, right? Or if you have any type of neurological deficit that we already went through, you must do a CT prior, do a lumbar puncture because you could herniate this patient. Otherwise, you don't. That's what the guideline says. If you do not have any evidence of CNS compromise or past medical history of CNS disease, or you're not immunocompromised, I do not need to do a CT before lumbar puncture. But who's gonna risk that in clinical practice? No one, right? But my guideline says no, so your answer must be no. So before, we're not gonna delay you, right? We have to do blood cultures and put the patient on empiric antibiotic with no one ready, so setting on banco, unless I have the possibility of immunocompromised disorder, which I add ampicillin, and to cover, if you read your books, we don't have to do a cyclo here, but we do in clinical practice because we need to cover viral conditions and encephalitis. So, depending on the, the CSF analysis is when you're going to discalate antibiotics, which we never do anyways in clinical practice, right? Have you seen antibiotics taken off even though nothing grows? No. But by guideline, you must discalate. So if you do have a positive grand stain, you continue the antibiotics that you started or you adjust based on sensitivity. Now, dexamethasone. Dexamethasone not only improves again the penetrance of this antibiotic into the blood-brain barrier, but also decreases mortality. There's a very, very much controversy about do it or not do it but it has been proven that decreases mortality, okay? And also decreases the possibility of the vancomycin or in the case that you must, because of allergies, add either Genta with vanco or chlorophenicol with vanco, decreases the possibility of nephrotoxicity and autotoxicity, okay? But if you see here that if you have to do a CT brain before lumbar puncture because the patient is immunocompromised or has a CNS disease or a recent surgery of the brain or the patient has focal neurological deficit or comes in with seizures, you do again, avoid what? Lumbar puncture. You can't do that. Even if you have a normal CT, you can't do it because the chances of having herniation on this patient is high. Because even though patient comes with seizures and the CT brain is normal, I don't know why the patient sees him. I, if I don't put an intraventriculostomy and measure the ICP myself, I cannot assure that there's no increase in intracranial pressure in that brain. So I have to skip that step, right? And 
and do the book cultures. Treat the patient. And even if the antibiotics will compromise my results of the lumbar puncture later on, when the patient is improving, I can do the lumbar puncture. Sometimes we just forget about it. Sometimes we do it just for the fact of diagnosis. Do you understand? So these are the normal values, but I want you to remember that the CSF of the pressure goes up to 180 and my patient had 300. And the patient that is real in Kendall Regional has 600. I'll show you the results. I'm not lying. Glucose, normally 40 to 85, less than 40. And remember, bacterial infections love to eat glucose. That's their metabolism is based on that, right? And another thing that I would like to see is if this uh, reporter, the lactic acid or the LDH, which is the same thing, lactic dehydrogenase. Remember that when you have a bacterial infection, it's severely harmful. Okay. Now, if you look at the um, differential, they say glucose size based on neutral fields and bands in the CSF will be high compared to lymphocyte in viral infections. Okay. And what else can we do in the CSF? Well, we could do grand staining cultures, but we also can uh, uh, culture uh, for possibilities of tertiary syphilis, okay? And the majority of these patients will be elderly. Believe it or not, um, we have a high risk in elderly population now with STDs. And uh, remember that also tertiary syphilis take years to occur, so, the primary is short term, up to a week. Then you have the secondary, 14 week, I mean, uh, 14 days, and then tertiary is lifetime. So sometimes you are an elderly, not properly treated for syphilis, and you come in not only with glomas with the tumors, but you can come in with uh, ultramentostatus. Okay, and so if you look at the difference between bacterial versus uh, uh, viral. Again, lymphocytes for viral in the differential for CSF, neutrophils for bacterial infection, and I want you also to concentrate on glucose. Normal sometimes, depending on the stage that you catch the patient, but that's, that's why you have the grand stain to help you, okay? But if the opening pressure is high and the quality of the fluid is turbid, it's bacterial to prove otherwise, even if the CSF, even if the glucose at that time still remains normal. The majority you will see high consumption. Like my patient had 20 of glucose, okay? Normally the CSF is actually two thirds of the plasma <coughs> glucose. And it has this uh, um, transport uh, um, saturation that it doesn't matter if your, if your glucose is 600 or 1000, you're still gonna have two thirds of a normal volume, okay? Unless it's consumption. So we talked about this. So what about having your xenophils in the differential CSF act the same way as plasma? So think about parasite. There are many third world country patients that come in either as visitors or as residents, recent, and they have uh, parasites. And there are many parasites that have a brain cycle. The same as many parasites have a long cycle. And we have caught parasites in the lung through bronchoscopies, okay? So think about um, parasitic infection for elevated eosinophils, and one relevant is uh, cancer. When your eosinophils are really high in CSF or plasma, could be cancer as well. <coughs> and again, remember that, um, <coughs> Based on the, I'm not gonna ask you like this, but based on the classification that we discussed at the beginning uh, of this presentation, if you have a gram positive staphylococcus, strep pneumonia is, is the most common, that's the aerobic. If you have a gram negative, think about an acerial meningitis. If you have a, 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 a gram negative cocobacilli, it's hemophilus influenza, okay? And if we have rots, and cocobacillus mostly anaerobic, or hysteria infection. So immunocompromised patients, alcoholic patients, amoxicillin covering hysteria. Okay? So this is repeated, this is repeated, this is repeated. Oh, I'm going back on the squat. Now, meningitis is
is not only bacterial meningitis, you also have another classification which is called aseptic meningitis. And aseptic meningitis is the same as encephalitis, which is a viral cause. Now, many medications can also produce encephalitis and meningitis, mostly anti-metabolites, uh, chemotherapies and radiations, uh, patients that are in immunomodulators, they have an autoimmune condition to begin with, but the, the medication itself can produce an inflammatory process in the brain or the encephalus without an infectious process. Do you understand? Atypical and aseptic meningitis as well is present in patients that have fungal meningitis, okay? So in other words, you have septic meningitis, which is bacterial, and you have aseptic meningitis or atypical, which is no more than other than bacteria. Could be viral, could be fungus, could be parasite, could be just an effect of a medication on it, an irritant. So the pearls we already went through, remember that pediatric patients, elderly patients, alcoholic patients, immunocompromised patients are the ones at risk for listeria, so you have to cover for those. Look for signs and symptoms of focal neurological deficit, which could include the same signs and symptoms of a stroke, so coming a patient with hemiplegia or hemiparesis or alteration of any cranial nerve or papal edema or in a CT scan seeing actually the uh, uh, um, midline shift or cerebral edema or hydrocephalus or compromise of the third ventricle, those are signs. If the patients have Curtis and Brusinski, those are signs. The nuchal rigidity itself is a sign of not focal neurological deficit, and those patients must have a CT brain before spine. Never, 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 never delay treatment because of the CT or the lumbar function, okay? Like this patient, for example, had to be sedated with ketamine to do the lumbar puncture, uh, but he was already with antibiotics on board, okay? Because they came with automatic status and severely agitated. Now, another possibilities of, uh, um, of having a uh, focal neurological deficit is the patient uh, comes in already with seizures, uh, coma, delirium, even though uh, they don't progress so fast like this, uh, and you guess, again, have to think about immunocompromised uh, host, uh, those are also focal neurological deficits that you must do CT before, okay? This is the rash of the Neisseria meningitis, so not all the patients that have meningitis will have a rash, unless they have the release of toxins from the Neisseria meningitis, okay? But if you see this, most likely a points to Neisseria, even though the treatment is exactly the same. Mostly petechial with uh, echemoses, okay? They're non-blanchable rashes and non-pruritic. Highly contagious. The top of the algorithm, is also here for you in a table, so you must memorize this table. These are the patients that require CT prior lumbar function. Repeat it again. Okay? And treatment, even though you're gonna see the treatments separated by the most common pathogens, I want you to see the pattern. Just look for the pattern. What do I have for strep pneumonia? Rosephine plus vancomycin, right? What do I have for listeria meningitis? The above plus anthocytin. We already said that, right? What do we have for patients that have possibilities of CSF leak? How do you see CSF leak? Through the nose? Through mm -hmm. the ear, okay? That's the direct port of entry as well. So you do exactly the same, it won't be wrong, but because 
now we have the possibility of having pseudomonas, right? Or again, if the patient is being hospitalized, if the patient is coming from a nursing home, the same criteria for pneumonia. If the patient is uh, in prisons, if the patient has received uh, prior antibiotic treatment in the in the in, in 90 days, Michael. Or what are the other possibilities? Dapto. What's the other possibility? Dapto. Sleep as I go. Right. Same coverage for MRSA, right? And as we said, any immunocompromised patient, what do you do? Forget about the ceftazidine. You could do rosafin. It's a third generation as well. Okay? So rosafin plus banco plus. Amoxicillin is in the immunocompromised patient. And as you continue on and on and on and on, you will see exactly the same pattern. If you have, just, just, just summarize up to there, if you have any patient with allergic to penicillin, what will you get? Can you give cefotaxin? Yes, yes, no. Can you give cefotaxin? No. If you look at the choices, you have here rifampin, you have Bactri, you have uh, gentamicin, or you have uh, um, Marin, which are the carbapenin, Marin, imipenin, carbapenin, right? So those are the possibilities of a patient with uh, uh, allergic uh, to penicillin. So it's a type one. What will you go, what will you give? Genta plus banco, which is really hard, you know, toxic. You can also do doxy with vanco. You could do Bactrin with vanco. Uh, you can do rifampin with vancomycin. But if you want to avoid those combinations because vanco and genta and vanco and chloramphenicol, they're really, really hard for the kidneys and the ears, what will you get? Go straight to the carbapenems and add vanco. Okay? Any questions? No question? Okay. So when you have the summary right here, as I can tell you, look. You have a patient with strep pneumonia. What do we have? Rosetic flows banco. Yes? Mm -hmm. You have a patient with Neisseria meningitis. Rosetic. Are you going to leave banco alone? Because if the patient has Neisseria meningitis, it's a serious condition, right? Mm -hmm. So just add the banco to it. You have... Um, Hysteria. We already know that you can use the above plus ampicillin. Even though you can use also for uh, uh, meningitis penicillin G, we don't do that in clinical practice. Rarely. Okay? Stop. Depending if it's MSSA or MRSA, right? If we use if we, if we do MSSA, we can do rosefin and vanco even though we have vanco here and we have nasticillin or oxacillin, but rosefin will cover those anyways. Do you understand or not? Mm -hmm. If you're suspecting MRSA, add the vanco to it. You already have it. Why do we use rifampin? Remember rifampin, you could use it for allergic to penicillin, but also you might see it along the cocktail of these antibiotics to improve the penetrance of the antibiotics through the blood brain barrier. Yes, I saw a question. I just had a question on the GBS. Uh, when the woman put up going to labor and the GBS positive, they treat them with penicillin. Mm -hmm. uh, but if they're allergic, they do they do clean the mice. But they, that doesn't cover the baby. So I don't know why they do that and why they don't use then rosepin. Rosepin is part of the penicillin then. Yeah. If you can't get rosepin. So, but then why treat it? But you, you just told me that the, the patient was allergic to penicillin, so you cannot give penicillin. I mean, the best the best choice for a pregnant woman would be penicillin family because they are category B. Would they clean but the mycin the basically covers uh, uh, mostly anaerobic bacteria, even though it covers gram positive. But are you going to give vanco to a pregnant woman that can that baby can be born with uh, congenital death? You can't. 
can, right? So clean that has a very poor penetrance, uh, but basically that's the least invasive for the baby. Uh, I wouldn't choose refamping, which is an aminoglycoside, gentamizing is an aminoglycoside, vancomycin, even though it's not an aminoglycoside, can also produce autotoxicity and nephrotoxicity. She can have ampicillin or naphthylin or oxacillin or ceftriaxone or um, any of the penicillin family that we have mentioned already because she's allergic to penicillin. The maximum that she can give is carbapenem independent, but uh, again, it's harmful for the baby. So you can give sulfa factory to this patient because it's also category uh, D. So what choices do you have? Dangerous treatment. Yeah. Sometimes they do it a bit intra thickly, so it could be more penetrance for, for her or the baby. Okay? So in reality, there's no much choices on her. But Clindas, you can see, it's not even in, in the list of guidelines for meningitis. Okay? So I want you to also look at the alternative guide. As you can see, if you're completely lost, you can do carbapenems. So you can go higher up. If you're not sure about which you don't have to kill the mosquito with the bomb, right? But if you're completely lost and you're not sure of your alternative of treatment, and you're not sure if, okay, what about chloramphenicol with Vanco, or Genta with Vanco, or Vactrin with Vanco, what should I do? Go straight to carbapenems, plus Vanco and you will be covered, okay? Now, in another example is fluoroquinolones. It's an alternative of treatment that has less penetrance, but if you have no other choice, you could do fluoroquinolones like Levaquin with Vanco, but you can have Vanco, you can have Levaquin, but what choices do you have, okay? So let's go to break, and I'll open the case, and I'll show you the real case, and then